The Lord of the Rings, the rings of the Lord of the Power Rings, is here at last. And the truth is, I've been really struggling to make up my mind about it, to pass the difference between this is not how I would have done it and this is bad because those are two different things, and I'm not always sure where that line is. Half the world is determined to convince me this is the best thing ever made and we should all lick Bezos' shiny bald head as a thank you, and the other half will not stop till I acknowledge that this is the corporate equivalent of urinating on Tolkien's grave. But what did you think of it? Or if you haven't watched it, what would you want from it? Also, all future episode reviews are gonna be taking place over on the second channel, To The Future, linked below, because I don't really wanna overload the main channel with content you guys you guys you guys <laughs> you guys may not be as invested in the second channel is a lot more casual where i do book reviews rants rambles random things go subscribe over there so the rings of power one of those things that I maybe wouldn't have done would be the Halffoots, okay? These pre-Hobbit Hobbits who seem like they're gonna be a big part of the story to come. The thing is, you know, they're fun and likable and they have this childish inquisitiveness that we love with this sense of an insular world that is separated from the outside. And all of that isn't bad writing, but... The Second Age isn't about hobbits, it's about Numenor and elves, and I can't escape the feeling that this is like they're trying to remind us that this is just like the Lord of the Rings, that familiar part, right? Rather than the Halfwoods being essential to the story that they purportedly want to tell, the Second Age. See, in my mind, the addition of the Halfwoods is quite different to, say, the story of Arendir and Bronwyn, who are also new characters, because Theirs is a storyline from the perspective of people who live in the lands that Sauron or Numenor will one day conquer and oppress. So creating these new characters has narrative value. And I mean, I don't know what they're going to do with the Halffoots yet, but it doesn't feel super relevant or it feels manufactured in a way. Arendir and Bronwyn's story connects more deeply to Galadriel and Elrond, and I'm not feeling that for the Halffoots yet. It just makes the story feel a little bit messier and muddier than it may have otherwise been. Similarly, there's the scene where Galadriel ends up in the ocean and she's fighting a sea monster and I can't tell if I didn't like that because it was like they were trying to manufacture tension when it wasn't really needed because please, please don't look away. I promise things are happening really quickly. Or because personally, I would have just written something more subtle and that doesn't make it bad, right? But the law, ah, yes, the law. Well, there was law, and um, they, they, they didn't get all of the law right. Uh, not even close, uh, you could say. Uh, but I, I get why that's frustrating. I totally get why that's frustrating as a law Tolkien nerd myself. But that is not the same thing as it being bad writing. You can call it a, a bad adaptation, potentially, but it's not the same thing as bad writing, right? It's not even the same thing as, as respecting Tolkien, and I want to talk about that. Like, I've seen people complain about how Finrod was seen crying and breaking down in the battle scene at the beginning because he's, he's disrespecting Tolkien and, 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 and Finrod's meant to be this unwavering hero, but uh, no, it, not at all. Like, j just because it was never stated that he was crying during this battle, that's disrespecting Tolkien. No, I mean, elves, when they cry enough, they can literally die. Literally die from grief. <laughs> I think I'm personally more interested in whether or not the story reflects the deeper ideas and questions and themes that are woven throughout Tolkien's writing, right? Rather than specific niche details. So in that light, some changes I'm fine with and some I am not. Like the Harfoots. Maybe I wouldn't have written them in, but I don't think that they fundamentally disrespect Tolkien's philosophy or writing. Same with the compressed timeline. I just don't really mind that so much. Whereas in The Rings of Power, it is heavily implied that Gilgalad, the High King of the Noldor, has personal control or authority over whether elves can sail west to the Undying Lands. You see it happen at the end of The Lord of the Rings, right? Uh, and that 
does annoy me. Not simply because Galadriel was banned at this point from going to the Undying Lands, in most versions, but because the very personal decision to sail west is all about our personal relationship with God, with the divine, with our mortal bodies, with uh, our con conception of death. These thematic discussions of mortality and spirituality and the close connection between the elves and the Valar, and I felt like that story beat in Rings of Power was kind of undercutting that. Then, at the end of episode two, there's this scene that suggests that maybe the dwarves have found a Silmaril, a really important gemstone in the Silmarillion. Hence the name. And I want to be clear, I really hope it's not a Silmaril. I hope it's Mithril or something else, but the Silmaril should not come back for those narrative and thematic meanings. I view that as pretty important to the integrity of the story that they're telling. Durin, the king of the khazad dwarves, is seemingly a hereditary title, which is an interesting decision, but I think that it really takes away from the depth of the dwarven culture that we see in the books. So yeah, there are changes that do irk me more than others. None of them mean that I can't enjoy the series just yet. Like I want to be clear, like I'm a, probably quite forgiving in that sense, but it does affect how I view the series. Now Galadriel's portrayal, I gotta be clear, is not one of those things. Uh, the lore does not support the idea that she never fought, that she was never a warrior or didn't hold a sword or anything like that. Uh, and I actually personally quite enjoy this interpretation of her character at this point in history uh, with the hints of the kind of person that she will become. So yeah, I'm gonna need to see a lot more, but you know, it's a mix of things at the moment. At the same time, there are tons of little references that are really cool to pick up on that are for the book nerds, right? Like the, the repeated motif of Laurelin's golden leaves and set design and crowns and the clothing. There are references to the Silmarils, to Fanor, to the unseen world, which is something Tolkien really didn't write about very much, but is an important element. There's this line, that the very first line at the beginning of the episode is nothing was evil in the beginning, which is a quote talking about Sauron, funnily enough, uh, and kind of builds into a lot of the wider themes of Tolkien's writing that I personally really appreciate, and I'm glad that they're narrowing in on that. Like when we meet the stranger and he he seems to have his, his, his magic or power expressed through his voice, and I think that's great because the, the power of the voice and, 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 and kind of like the magic of everyday activities and just the physical body is a really important uh, element of how Tolkien does magic in Middle Earth. Now, I don't know who the stranger is. I really, really hope he's not an Astari. I hope to hell he's not Gandalf. Uh, that would be annoying for me personally, but I have no idea who else he could be. I have no idea, but there are these two moments which are really cool when he uses the voice. One of them um, sucks all the fire that he's just landed in when he comes in this crater, in this comet, sucks all the fire back into him and he, he takes it all up into himself and he's Whoa! and then he collapses and the fire all goes back out. It was real cool to watch. And then secondly, when he's, he's feeling intimidated and, and sort of the natural world bends around his voice, you know, there are those references in, uh, in, in, uh, the Lord of the Rings to Saruman using his voice and the power of his voice. So I think that's very cool. But if I see a wizard shooting fireballs, just kill me. I'm gonna be angry. I think Khazad Doom is gorgeous. I, I love how they, and you only see it for a second, but they use mirrors to get light down into the tunnels. I love that they weren't afraid to use greenery in Khazad Doom. I love that there's this color to it. And the passage to the Undying Lands being this ritualistic, otherworldly thing is really cool to see. There are some moments where we get very little information about these things from the books and Rings of Power expands upon them in ways that I am often quite impressed with. But at the moment, at the same time, I need to be convinced that this is Middle Earth and not just something with references to it. It needs to go deeper than that. And I think at the moment it's missing just a little bit of charm or a little bit of authenticity. 
a little bit of magic, you might say. Oi! Oh, no, 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 no. This one was just getting in the way and uh, destroying my lights. So no, I'm gonna pick you up. The writing was okay, right? Like it has its moments. And before any of you call me a shill, Amazon literally reached out to me and said, hey, we'll pay you to make a review. And I said, you don't get any control over what I say. And then they ghosted me. So, you know, don't, don't be a dick, all right? Elrond, by the way, in Rings of Power is genuinely a pleasure to watch. I really enjoyed his scenes. He's familiar to the one we know from, from Fellowship. He's kind of this well-mannered man who has a touch of humor to him, but also manipulation. Like he's a leader, he's kind of a politician. And I kind of liked that. All of his scenes were enjoyable though, because he's well acted, he's well scripted. Uh, and, two, and two, he seems to be the axis around which three of our main plot lines are kind of spinning. The, the relationship between the elves and Khazad Doom, uh, the forging of the Three Rings, and the, the rise again of Sauron. So all of his scenes seem to have a consequentality. That's not a word. A consequentialism. A con... con what's the word? They all have a good pace and consequence to their scenes. <laughs> One thing they did do well was make all of our major Elvish players feel very different on screen. They all have a presence of their own. You know, Gladriel is this war-weary person recovering from her grief. Alrond as this gentle leader and friend. Calabrimbor as this ambitious and arrogant man with a future. And um, Gilgalad too, though I will admit that I don't think he's a particularly good representation of uh, Tolkien's Gilgalad from the books, but I do think for the moment he's an interesting character in the story. On the other hand, and this is the same hand, so on the, on this hand, uh, there, there were also a lot of expositional scenes that felt a little bit awkward in the first two episodes, like a lot, uh, about the past and about Silmarils and the love between elves and men and Morgoth and Sauron and the men who fought for uh, Morgoth and Valinor. And they really stick out because these scenes that have a lot of exposition are also the first ones that we get with a character. Part of the reason that I think Elrond worked so well for me was that his scenes didn't have this so much, and so his scenes could focus on character and relationships and further those. I think some of the exposition could have waited a couple of episodes, and maybe it would have been better if they took a bit more time to just establish that central elven cast, you know, Elrond and Gilgalad and Calabrimbor and, and, and Galadriel, uh, before they expanded to those other characters outside of it instead of jumping around the place. There is some clunky dialogue here or there, like the moment that the Gladriel says, you know, if the darkness is, is gone, then why isn't it gone from in here? You know, conflicted. And there is a tad of what I'll call marvelization of dialogue, which is when there's this quippy back and forth, often based on kind of mocking someone. It's sort of fake banter in a way. You see it a little bit with Durin and Deesa, but it really wasn't too intrusive. I just get annoyed by it, probably unreasonably so. But there were also some really genuinely clever and poetic exchanges. The worst parts were definitely the opening scenes. We have some of the worst weightless CGI, the worst fight scenes, some of the worst exposition, some of the worst acting too, because children. Uh, but it does tend to get better from there and it's undoubtedly strongest in its quietest, slowest moments. There are a couple of plot beats that raise an eyebrow of just, you know, why did the character do that? But it wasn't that bad, I don't think. The thing is, I was never not enjoying myself. It was never so egregiously offensive that I just wanted to turn it off. But neither was I ever feeling really wowed, with the exception of maybe seeing like the trees, Telperion and Laurelin at the start. Just seeing anything from the Silmarillion is like, wah. <laughs> And I did have a lot of feelings of not how I would have done this. Like the opening scene where Gladriel and her crew go to try and find Sauron and they end up fighting a troll. It just struck me as a little bit of an uninteresting way to handle that, that they're establishing the threat is still out there. All of this gave me an overall, huh, meh, hmm, however you want to put it, right? 
I am yet to be enraptured, but I am willing. I will admit, sometimes I feel like I am being tricked, okay? Because with these huge, big budget shows that are coming out these days, I mean, they're, they're, they're gorgeous. They sound amazing. They look incredible. They better when you're spending a billion dollars on this, Jeff. <laughs> Do you ever find yourself wondering, like, is this actually good or am I just tricking myself into thinking it is because there's so much money here? <laughs> but at the same time, Bear McCreary's musical score is genuinely phenomenal. It sold me more on this series than I think anything else and everything else combined, basically. Uh, look up his themes for Cousin Doom and uh, Nobody Goes Off the Trail. Those are the themes for The Hobbits. Uh, and for the dwarves. They are brilliant. The musical design manages to feel familiar, like, you know, we still use wind instruments for hobbits, we use trombones for evil, we use uh, vocals for elves, uh, but it's also new and inventive. It feels uh, different. The musical motifs are very present in the story in a very good way, and they are, in my opinion, the things that comes closest to, to, to reminding me that I am in Middle Earth, to bringing me back into it. And that's okay. So absolute credit there. And also the practical effects, especially the ones we see on the new orcs. The new orc design is, is kind of horror themed, it's animalistic, it works really damn well. Absolute credit there as well. And to be honest, I'm not gonna take that away from people as something legitimate to enjoy, that when they sit down and they hear that, they're like, yeah, I, I like this. I don't want to dismiss that as like a shallow enjoyment of the sh of the series. Not really. I also feel like sometimes we're a bit hyperbolic, right, about things being bad or good, uh, that they can only be one of those two things. We often don't give stories enough time to grow. And this is going to sound weird, but it's okay for a story to be just okay and to still enjoy it. The Rings of Power does feel a little bloated at times. It does feel like a cash grab. It does feel like it's trying to do too many things at once. But it wasn't made by Jeff Bezos. Like, not really. It was made by artists and writers and actors and composers and sound designers and costume designers and cinematographers and directors. And where those people deserve praise, I want to give it to them. And I also don't want to lambast the people who might just be happy to be back in Middle Earth in any capacity, you know, no, no matter how inaccurate it might be or how imperfect the writing is. I actually think that there's something quite beautiful in loving imperfect stories. I'm not there yet with the Rings of Power, not personally. And I know that that isn't the hottest take, but there it is. The Rings of Power, isn't perfect. I think at the moment it just feels okay to me and you can make of that what you want. I have too many thoughts and I am going to do episode by episode future reviews over on the second channel but I want to probably do a breakdown and autopsy of the series on the main channel at the end right where I talk about everything. <laughs> the second channel is a lot more casual where I can just sort of talk and ramble and rant uh, on anything and everything but those reviews are going to be coming out there so subscribe down Below. What did you guys think? Do tell me down below. Stay nerdy and I'll see you in the future.